So, the flock. Uh, it's actually been a while before I could say that name of our game again with, uh, while well, being a bit proud. But um, I'm going to tell you guys about the risks we took, uh, about failing, and what it's worth. So, just a quick introduction for the people that don't know me. I'm uh, Jeroen van Assel. I'm the creative director and designer for Vogelsop. And Vogelsop is a studio that specializes in making uh, thrilling 3D experiences that we present in an event and adventurous-like manner. So, the vlog. Um, I hope most of you know it, but just a quick introduction of what this game is about. I'll try to skip through this presentation as fast as possible. Um, but the vlog is a scary multiplayer game. So, in our game, you can actually be the monster. You see these three monsters? You'll be one of those in our game, first person. But the goal of the game is to become the carrier. And the carrier is the little guy in the middle with the light. You have to become him to win this game. Now here's the catch. The flock, they're not allowed to move into the light. So if they run into the light and move, they burn and die. But if they decide to stand still, they transform into a statue and they cannot be killed by the light. So that is like the basic principle of our game. So you now have like a bit of an understanding how this game will play out. And this is how we started. This is uh, us in the, our second year of school presenting our first prototype on, uh, on Gamescom. Um, quick, what's important to know is that it was our first free project, so we could decide what we wanted to do in school. Um, we based our team on hard skills, so we selected everyone on what they could add to the project in terms of like art, design, programming. Uh, we received quite some press coverage in the beginning, and we showcased on a lot of events. And this is how the game looked back then, just to get you uh, thing. And it was all through a mentality of just let's do it, just let's go with it, we want to make a game, we're going to make it awesome, you know. Uh, I don't know if you know this guy, like, just do it. That's, that was our mentality, like, almost literally, but just do it wasn't enough. <laughs> didn't, didn't work out that well. Um, we couldn't keep up the enthusiasm nor, enthusiasm nor the pace. So all the events, we won a uh, Dutch Game Award for students back then, it was like, we were really excited, we got press coverage. Definitely could not keep that up. Um, people, we found out people had different uh, ambitions. So out of that photo you just saw before, uh, I'm the only one left with Vogelsup. Um, I'll talk about that later as well. Um, prototyping was also a lot different than production. So um, we actually found out like when you prototype, you can make a lot of changes real easy. You get a lot of feedback. But then when you actually have to produce a game, you got to think about a lot more things like how is this actually going to work in the player sense? How are we going to sell it? How is it going to work with Steam, localization, everything? Um, and we also found out that having the right hard skills wasn't enough. We found out people had di totally different work schemes. Like somebody, some people decide to uh, it's nice to work when you're starting 11. Some really like to work in the morning. Others had like. Uh, they like to do like chill out together, the other ones just want to play games. And there was also like a lack of vision for everything, especially for things outside of the game. So how are we going to run this business? How, what are we going to do? How are we going to sell this game? So two years later, um, that's when we, it's about now, uh, it was a long journey with a lot of challenges. And it took, those struggles took us actually a lot of time, especially because we were inexperienced students. So. We had to become professionals. We started to work with not only Scrum, but also like a lot of industry tools like Slack and Trello, 
uh, make sure how to plan this game to, try to get um, like an actual thing going on. Um, we had to drop the people that wanted different things. That was probably the most difficult part. We had people that wanted to do different ambitions, but also people that weren't in line with the project. We also had that the group just didn't function together well together with uh, the people that um, were there before. So I think there are actually quite some in here right now that we're still friends with, but just didn't function very well in terms of the project in the end. Um, this was also important. We needed to think ahead of what's needed for the game. So we actually reworked the flock about four times, I think. Uh, most parts of it just like just didn't think ahead of what was needed to actually make this into a full game that we could sell. And we tried to, with the team that we had, make sure that we did a lot of bonding. So uh, do group activities together. Try to openly discuss what kind of directions we're going to take and. This was also a big struggle because everyone wants to have a say in what direction you're going to take, so you're going to lose like track of which way you should go. Or, um, yeah, definitely a big struggle. I'll get into that a uh, bit more in depth later. And last one, we needed to create a vision not just for the game but also for the company. Like, where was this going to lead to? What are we going to do? What are we going to do after the game? So, for the game first, we made three core design goals. So. The way we worked before, uh, I was creative director and game designer back then as well, so I had like a general idea in my head what this game was going to be like, but I failed to communicate it properly to the team. So what I worked on is making sure that everybody understood what this game was going to be about. First of all, we wanted to make an immersive game. And with an immersive game, we mean that you really feel like you're being the monster. You really feel like you're being hunted when the other players are hunting you. Um, that works through the camera animations, the HUD, everything. Second of all, we wanted to make a scary, intense game. So every new feature had to add to one of these three design goals and made it more tense and scary. You had to be frightened from a game, maybe get like a mini heart attack or whatever. That was very important. Not gore or blood, that's like something else. We wanted to make like tense. And third of all, we wanted to make an unconventional game. So we wanted to make it do it different and make it different and do it in a different way than other games were doing. So we actually get a lot of comments from people that played on conventions that used to play, I don't know, Call of Duty or whatever, and they find it a really weird game. Um, that's a good thing in our case. Then we decided to make a corporate culture of, for Vogelsep. What is Vogelsep? When we get two new team members, it has to be a Vogelsep. So to what kind of lines uh, do they have to um, like uh, convey to to be a vocal stepper. So we're a loud, unconventional bunch of social people. We really like to fool, uh, like make jokes, uh, have fun. That's that's us. Um, we're also inspired and, and interested in more than just games. We like to look like watch films, but also like look at culture, do activities, do interest in what's going on in the world. We bring like loads of different streamings of uh, inspiration to and discuss that during our uh, working hours. And third of all, we love thrilling experiences that bring novelty. So we want to, we're also looking for like new things. And this might not have been true for all of the people, but definitely most of the group. And we think it's important to keep that in mind for our company. So this is one of the things, embrace your corporate culture. That's thing, that thing I learned way too late in our production, but it's very important. So this is me. Uh, on a mountain, on the highest mountain in Slovenia. And I decided to go uh, backpacking for a bit before launching the game a few months ahead, because I knew it was going to be a struggle. So I decided to climb the highest mountain to do something thrilling, get myself excited, and get my mind off you know, the hard work that was laying ahead of me, and embracing like the corporate culture. Because at that point, a few moments later, we were going to announce something that um, was never been done before in the gaming industry. So. I'll tell you a bit about that later as well. This was the market we're facing. Steam. Uh, I know you guys know Steam, but these are just like some facts. Steam is very big. If, you're on, if you want to release on PC, you got to be through Steam, unless you're Minecraft or something. But Steam is the way you want to go. And if you look at it, there are like tons of games on Steam. And they come, they'll increase like every year. Like I think uh, 2014 had more games in half a year than the whole of 2013. And the same goes through for 2015. So this was a very tough market. So we were facing a challenge. And for us, it was immediately clear that we needed to do something different 
to stick out, to be that lamp that you know, uh, people would notice. And we needed to make sure that people would know about our game. And also, because we were a multiplayer only game, which is already very difficult to do, we needed to have a big player base. Because if another player was going to buy this game and there was no player base, they would have nobody to play against and essentially would have no game at all, actually. So it was definitely a tough challenge. And for us, it felt like playing it safe is not playing it safe at all. I mean, literally, there are tons of indie games. I just came back before Indigo to EGX and I saw 100 new indie games again, and they all just kind of look the same. There's, the time just stopped being where you could just remember every game that came out and you could actually have time to play them. It just, those times don't exist anymore. They're just way too many games. And you gotta find your market, your audience, and make sure they know about your game. So we wanted to do something different. And that's how we came up with the population plan. Uh, population plan, first of all, uh, was about uh, creating an authentic experience. So if you pay attention in our game, you started as a monster, the flock, but as a flock, you either die from the light or you successfully become the carrier, which is a different creature. Now, in both these scenarios, there is no flock anymore. So if this would be in like a real world, it would actually mean the flock is a very tragic race because it's doomed to extinction at some point. I don't know if you understand it, but at some point the flock would just die out in our game if this would be like a real world. We wanted to convey that extinction story into our multiplayer experience through a meta game. So if you see that number, those are the amount of lives left in our game. Um, so every time one of the flock dies, one life will be taken out of that number and it will drop down till it reaches zero, till actually flock get extinct. And I find this interesting because this is actually telling a story I think games were meant to be doing, not like telling a story that's like written in a book or doing a cutscene, which is like a film, but more like create events that people can experience and then can tell a story about. Um, and this is what I think multiplayer games um, could make very interesting for multiplayer games, sorry. Anyway, our idea was that during the population that would change, we will actually change the game itself as well. I mean, this would influence the real population of the flock, right? So it would actually have an influence on what kind of experience the players would have in our game. And then the idea was, okay, so when it reaches zero, it would mean we would stop selling the game. Nobody ever can buy this game again when that counter hits zero. And only the players that have it, they go to the second phase of our game which we have not detailed yet, and we're not going to detail, like we have our idea, we're still uh, envisioning that as what we want to do with our game. And they're the only ones that can experience that second phase, and that will actually have a climactic ending, after which the game will never be playable again, ever. So this is something very bold and different, and not something you could usually expect from your game. So why would we do this? First, it was in line with our design goals, I mean, it was tense, it was unconventional, um, it was also very immersive, it really created like this ongoing event. Second of all, we could tell the story of the flock, which we didn't knew how to do before. Um, it's in line with our corporate culture as well, because we like thrilling new experiences, we like to do this kind of stuff. It could potentially solve the market challenges, so it would make us stick out, it would also make sure that um, because we're like creating this event, our concentration of players that would be interested in the game would be higher because they would have to play it in between a certain time frame. And, oh, I think I skipped one. Ah, no, nah, that's uh, the other thing. Anyway, and that's, it's a risk, but first of all, I want to tell you like, what does it mean to take a risk? It means you have high stakes. It means it's less likely other people are doing it, so it's gonna be easy, more easy set your part. And there will be more higher rewards, but also far harder and deeper failures. <laughs> so what we are uh, risking is, we were risking that because it was so different, people would not understand. It would mean we really had to try our best to make sure people would actually understand what was going on. Um, it also meant capping your sales, because at some point you could just can't sell the game anymore. So at some point we would just not, we're not able to sell the game. Um, it also meant like we have a very high chance of failing uh, because it's different, it's controversial. Um, yeah, you probably have a higher chance of failing as well. 
And we knew for sure that because we were doing this, people were going to be a lot more critical about the game. At first, you had a small indie game with students, you know, doing this, I guess, uh, cool, kind of cool game. But if you're like making this bold statement, people were going to be a lot more critical, being a lot more attention, like expecting a lot more out of your game. And on the other side, it also could mean that people were not interested at all because it was different. It just meant like, ah, oh, we don't, we don't want this. We don't want the game to, if you don't understand, we don't want the game to never end or, or mean end at some point. So it could mean you're not selling. The thing that we did get out of it immediately though when we announced it, like amazing exposure. So actually this potentially solved one of the challenges uh, immediately like, oh, wow, people immediately knew of it. A lot of press loved it. We had like more than 500 articles. We just couldn't keep track of it. We had actually somebody else carrying these articles. That's good for us. But even further than just gaming websites, uh, it was on a lot of tech websites, a lot of culture websites. Uh, we increased our, like this is a role trailer. And back then when we released it, I, got, I think it got like 25,000 views. And then over a few months, it got like 10,000 more. And as soon as we just hit that uh, announcement, immediately it just tenfold. This is like 365,000 views. That was just like, whoa, so many people now know about this game. Um, and all the other trailers as well, they just have like you know, lots, lots, I think our teaser are like 200,000 and our launch trailer on Steam is what, like more than a million. It's like a lot. But the thing, uh, we expected people to have questions, but we didn't expect like, like it would be that many. 75% also reacted very angry and did not want this and were like very like upset. Like why would they do this? And they had tons of questions. And it was because the first announcement was more about doing this, like this is what we're going to do, without explanation why and how many lives and everything, because we wanted to like spread it out, like make let's build up and then explain why we're doing this. This might have been, in hindsight, I don't know, a bit of a bad idea. Uh, I don't know, we probably would have get, gotten less exposure, but that would have been fine. The thing is, people were really angry, like this is a literal quote from what I found on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we, yeah, we definitely had a lot of people being angry and just not understanding. Um, so we tried to tackle these questions and we wrote a fact um, detailing like this is why we're doing it and if you're going to read it anywhere else we can't guarantee if that's the right information but what you're reading here is exactly right. Um, we try to save up as much newsworthy content to bundle it and send it out to press after a few weeks so we could reach out as far as possible again, because that's what you want to do. You can't just keep like sending out a few messages because press won't pick up on it. You want to have like one big of chunk so you can reach a lot of press at the same time, if you're going for that way. But still, press managed to spawn their own story. We had other press saying like, and when it reaches zero, um, the game, you can never play the game again. Um, it, it was all different and we just couldn't handle it because there were just too many articles doing weird things. And then when people read it, they're going to have like their whole different kind of interpretation as well. They're going to just read the headline or just a few bit and I don't know, we have so many people coming out of booth just not understanding it and when we explain it, they finally come around, oh okay, that's why you're doing it, oh okay, now it makes sense, oh that's actually a pretty cool idea. Um, and then we had also a lot of press that just didn't pick up on it. So they just got like the first statement and their following of that website just did not have get the explanation at all. And they're just thinking, they're still angry at us, I think. <laughs> okay, anyway, this was all before launch and we were still confident, although we had like so many people angry because our beta build was fairly stable. Our previews had been positive and uh, actually quite a lot of them been f super positive. And players that actually played the game at defense um, we were very enthusiastic. And we also had uh, a lot of developers played it and also IndieFund, which are like very experienced developers who backed us, who believed in it. So we were like, okay, we still have a good game. Uh, we're gonna do this and people will understand and find out later. So then we launched and th this is how it felt like. Okay, we're gonna like jump into that ball that is empty with, with no games and we'll be like different and uh, we're not sure what's, you know, the other half gonna look at but we think it's, uh, it's, it's gonna be all right because uh, we'll have a lot of swimming area and uh, yeah, that's how it go. I don't know, I don't think I have enough time. Is, does anybody 
seen our launch trailers? Anyone who like want to have like an idea what this game is about, or is, does the rest? I don't know how many know, of you know the flock? Okay, that's enough. I don't, I'm going to skip this trailer. Okay. Um, so you can, if, if you're not know it, you can look it up. Um, because I'm running out of time, I think a bit. Um, anyway, our launch felt very empty and dead. We had lots of hype before launch, and then at launch, it just what there was like nothing. We just and I knew what was going on exactly, but I think from somebody that was watching us, they were like, "What's going on?" I didn't hear about anything about this. So, what was happening is that we didn't have a stable build at launch. There were we added too many things at the end, so there were a lot of bugs, and we had a lot of press. But we've been good friends with like saying, oh, "I can't play it. I'm not going to review it now. Um, maybe later, and whatever." When we launched, we had 20 negative reviews on Steam within one hour. That was that hating group that was still angry at us, I think. But within one hour, they were like negative reviews, and ref most of them refunded as well. So that's what we got on our thing. Um, also, uh, there were games that looked similar to us, uh, like Evolve and that realm, who were cheaper than our game when we launched, because Evolve did a sale like them. Um, YouTubers couldn't play because we didn't have uh, the, the full screen and dual screen functionality bugged for some reason. We don't know how that got in there before launch. We tested everything two weeks ahead, but at launch it didn't work. So YouTubers were messing up, we're not going to play. And lots of YouTubers are also a fan of, uh, of developing that realm, which is kind of a competition maybe. And uh, doing all these things, stressing out, I just had no time and energy to push that launch anymore. I was not going after reviews anymore. I was like, okay, we got to fix this game first and how, what just happened and went wrong. Because that's how it is now. This is a very mixed reception. We have a 3.3 on Metacritic. I can't remember a game that has a 3.3 on Metacritic. And especially like, I mean, we, we also have like a mixed on Steam. So mixed on Steam is definitely hurtful as well. If you see that, you're like, who's going to be interested in mixed on Steam? It's not that well. We only sold 3,000 copies, which does mean we have around 6,000 players, but 3,000 copies is not enough. Uh, we did not make enough money. We did make enough money to pay any fund back, but definitely not, uh, not enough to get out of the cost. So uh, at the moment, it's a, a bit of a grim situation for me personally because my, all my uh, own things uh, are on the line at the moment. And our player base is already dead. Within two weeks, we have like, uh, I don't know, five players or something or ten players on a, on a day. So this is a very grim situation. So you can understand that. We expected it, like, oh, wow, we have like, tons of views. It doesn't matter. We only have to like, sell 10,000 copies. We'll be right. And uh, if we just got like, a six on Metacritic, it's fine. We like, really lowered our expectations. But still, our expectations were like, higher than what just happened. And we were like, whoa, what the fuck was going on? I mean, we were like this before, positive previews and everything, and then just a launch, just like on the ground over there. But also, we found out that this was also what the players have been experiencing. Because a lot of our players expected a lot more out of our game. And in reality, it was just a small, uh, maybe interesting uh, indie game. So two weeks after that, we felt very crushed and demotivated. Uh, we didn't want to do anything. Uh, we tried to like patch bugs and stuff, but um, we're definitely crushed. But then we started like, OK, we have to get over this. We have to dive into all that feedback and critique and find out what's going on. And it's like, I have like a list of 100 things, and most of them are just bullshit. It just doesn't say the issue. And, and I even filtered out the ones that say, like, oh, this is not a good game or it's a shit game, because you don't have any use for that kind of feedback. It doesn't help you at all. Um, this is just shit feedback. You can't do anything with it. Um, but at some point, we start to find, out, we find like, a, a rhythm like this, this, we could all put this in three categories. And there, those are important to what went wrong with our launch. So first challenge is our pr the price versus content wasn't good. We asked 17 bucks for a game that only had three maps and one game mode, which is not competitive uh, compared to, like for example, Evolve or um, <coughs> that realm. So it's going to take some water. So, although 17 bucks might be fine for some people to have like good evening of fun, it was definitely not competitive to other asymmetrical multiplayer games throughout there on Steam. Um, 
second, the bugs. Um, we not only had bugs of Rome, we just, because we implemented things uh, just at the very latest, but also Windows 10 launched, which definitely just all the people, like there was a free upgrade to go Windows 10, a lot of players did that, and it was at the same time we launched a game, that just fucked us up. Everybody that went to Windows 10 could not play our game because it did not, um, okay, it did not work. And the longevity of the game wasn't very good. So people liked it for two hours or one hour or whatever, but after that the player base just dropped. They stopped playing because it got too repetitive. So what we're going to do is at Halloween, we're going to drop the price, which is an easy fix. I mean, that's easy. We can't do it in the first month, but at Halloween we can drop the price. We're going to patch. We've patched most of the bugs. We're going to patch some more bugs. We're going to add several new game modes and in the map. This is content we already planned, but we're going to like push it forward. We're going to create a thank you package for the current players. Uh, try to sustain from that moment on the player base for smaller updates we've got planned. And if we're going to need extra players, we're going to like make a free demo for a short amount of time or get it on bundles later or have a free weekend. So that was our plan. And then we had like several events after launch. So we felt like oh, our game is the shittiest game ever. We had like, this is nobody's going to like it. But then we went to events. This is EJX, this Tokyo game show. We did some of several others. And the crowd still f loved it. They really were enthusiastic about it. Like, oh, I'm going to buy this game. Or we have people saying, this is the best game I've played on the whole show floor. So we're like, what? what's going on? This is not right. This is not making any sense at all. Why has it been so positive before and positive now again? And the launch just went terrible. So what happened is we built a game based on feedback of events. And on an event, you're going to play this game for like 15 minutes or maybe an hour. We had devs playing it for an hour at the most. And they felt like it's good. And they like added things in their head like, oh, it's going to be fine. And they loved it. I want to play some more. But we never had people sitting down for a long session and like playing it and like find out written down, like, when do they quit? When do they have enough of this game? Um, and that is one of the biggest mistakes we made. And I would definitely recommend anyone not doing uh, making that same mistake. I mean, if you're making a single player game with a very tight, cool two hour experience, that's fine because they can never play. But because we're a multiplayer only game, we need that player base. We need players to play longer than just that. So that's why I focus on Halloween on the game modes as well to make it hopefully longer sustainable. Um, so, <laughs> last thing. Okay, I'm going to finish it. In hindsight, what went wrong? I do have to say we've probably been too ambitious for an inexperienced team. We try to do too many things, too big of a game with such a small team. Uh, the communication of population idea, although we definitely tried, we probably would have should have made it like a video that was easily shareable, so there was no discussion or error whatsoever what it was going to be about. Um, we added too many things just in the end. Uh, expectations, people, like a lot of reviews expect this is like a big team, or because we're making a 3D game, you're going to get compared to AAA productions, other productions. You need like make sure the expectations are right on the base of the game. And we based our event on feedback. But I do think there was nothing wrong with our population idea. We just failed to execute it properly. Uh, just in short, any change? Yeah, we shipped the game. Uh, we have tons of ideas of creating new events and adventures for games like this or different games. Uh, lots of lessons and experiences. And we saved like a huge network by going this uh, professional as a student team. So that's good. And this is the important part. So should you take risk? Yes, but follow these lines. Like, you're working in a creative, innovative technology industry, so you have to take risk. You have to do something new. You're like this passionate. There's everybody loves this, but you, you not want to do the same thing that's been done before. That's like one of the easiest things. So you're gonna take risk. But the higher the risk, you have to be prepared in every situation, like for success or for the fail. So. For example, the amazing exposure, we weren't prepared for that that much as we thought. That wasn't a success, but we couldn't handle it. The fail, um, yeah, that's, uh, I think that speaks for itself. <laughs> Make sure it's in line with your design goals. Make sure you know your market <laughs> Embrace the your vision. And uh, I, hope, I hope I see more exciting games uh, like this and do more events and uh, make sure it's like a once in a lifetime unique experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you.